you. You'll just have to pray for me, all right? But I'm probably in good company. Let's go to the Lord in prayer on this Palm Sunday. Gracious Lord, you're the one by your Holy Spirit who opens eyes and ears and minds to all that you have for us. That gracious Lord, as we turn to you, show us those things that are lasting, those things that we can count upon. Your mercy endures forever. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. A little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and stayed home from church with his mother. His father returned from church holding a palm branch. The little boy was curious and asked, Why do you have that palm branch, Dad? And he responded, Well, you see, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got palm branches today. The little boy replied, Ah, shucks. The one day that Jesus comes to town and shows up, I miss him. Today, we gather together to celebrate Palm Sunday. The day taken from the Gospels where a whole city threw a parade for Jesus. As Jesus rode into the city, the people threw palm branches in anticipation of his coming and laid them down before him. And so we get our term, Palm Sunday. This day marked a time of celebration where Jesus was worshipped and praised. But the day is also bittersweet. We know how it goes. It's bittersweet for us because even as we read the celebration, we know that Friday is coming, right? And the cross is coming. We know that many in this same crowd will fall in <coughs> far short of God's greatest desires. Within a few short days, they'll exchange words of praise to words calling for his death. They go from shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, and then later begin to cry out, crucify, crucify. So this morning I, I wanted to focus our attention on two verses which focused upon Jesus but with two different results. Matthew 27, 15, and I'm going to share that with you in a minute, and Luke 19, 36, 38. Matthew 27, 15 says, Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And Luke 19, 36 to 38, As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, and when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Billy Graham has been quoted many times as saying that the greatest mission field in our country today is actually in our local church. The people sitting already in our churches. I'm not sure whether this statement is true or not, but one thing I do know is that many people know what to say and how to say it, even how to act in it, but frequently when the rubber hits the road, we don't quite know what to do with it. And sometimes when we hear words like personal relationship with Christ, we even turn that around and we don't quite fully get what that means. No salvation, just empty words. We see a perfect example of this in the two passages I shared this morning. On Sunday, Jesus rides into the city with the people shouting praises and praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. And on Friday, they're shouting, give us Barabbas. We want him. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. So why the change? You know, you, you think they'd have a little bit more commitment. I mean, where is their heart actually committed? 
Now, I'm sure it's the second I, I said the word committed that I lost a number of folks just in saying that very word. You see, that's not necessarily a popular word these days. For a millennial crowd, they're said to completely phase out when you talk about being committed to God or church. But that's actually not true. They have their causes that they're committed to. They have things in their life that they value. The other group is the iGents. Have you heard about the iGents? I'm learning all this stuff. These are the folks who are growing up on Twitter and Instagram. Both the iGents and the millennials see themselves really as their own brand. Have you ever thought about that? Your own brand. And we don't, I don't know. Esther, do you necessarily think about brand Esther out there? <laughs> and your best, are you being your best Esther? I wonder if I'm being my best me. Last week we talked about being our best us with Jesus. You see, uh, we all come to find out things that we value in different groups, age segments even, have the things that they value. Well, most frequently the things that we value are things like money. Because it takes money to buy stuff, which helps us improve our brand. Well, God's seen our best brand. And we know from Scripture that all our righteous deeds are as what, church? Filthy rags. So how about if this Palm Sunday we stop trying to guilt people into commitment with Christ? Just take a deep breath and let that soak in. Let's stop asking folks to commit their lives to Christ. Pray a formula, prayer. And how about instead that we start perhaps to talk about God's unwavering commitment to us? You see, a committed faith is not self-centered. It's Christ-centered. Commitment, a committed faith begins in Christ and Christ alone and moves to us. It starts with Christ who rides a donkey down a dusty road, appreciating the accolades. I'm sure he's like, yeah, I can appreciate that. <laughs> I can't help but wonder as he's riding along, you know, as the palms cross his path, and out comes the garments to, to make the ride a little bit smoother. Does he know? Yeah, you're doing this, and it won't be long. You'll be turning tail. Laying into the inky darkness, you'll be shouting, crucify. You see, we do, in our nature, our own brand, we go from cheering to sneering just that quick, don't we? Those that are, the things that are popular get tossed away. Jesus, perhaps the most, I mean, they, they wanted him to be the kind of Messiah that solved all of their temporal issues. But he reproved over and over, I'm not that kind of Messiah. The fact that today's palms become next year's ashes should tell us something about really our nature and how fickle we are. Now you may not like that. You may not like hearing that either. But it's just so true. We're rarely committed to anything but ourselves. Save face, save or make it. That's why we need a Christ who is so committed to us that he endures the cheers as well as the spears. Christ knows we have the full potential 
of going from singing praises on Sunday to shouting crucify on Good Friday. Holy Week is none other than a good opportunity to look in the mirror and see our real brand. You see, we're fickle. We have feet of clay that begin to crumble the very second we lift our heel. Thank God Christ is so selfless that he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. <clears throat> so committed faith is not self-centered. It doesn't rely upon us. It begins with Jesus and his love toward us. The second thing is that a committed faith is relationship driven. We've heard this all the time, right? Committed faith is relationship driven. And I guarantee you that all over the place, preachers are going to tell you that a committed faith is, is relationship driven. But what they mean is that the problem is that you just aren't committed enough. Enough to your relationship with Christ. Maybe if we try a little bit harder. And so we get guilty once again. Well, see, the problem is that we can never be committed enough to our relationship with Christ in our own efforts. So today, I'm giving you an opportunity to take a deep breath and just take in that sombering, sober moment and let it resonate within you that we could never be so committed in our faith to Christ. Christ had to first come to us because if we could, we wouldn't need Christ or his cross. And I don't care how many sinners' prayers you pray. Have you prayed them? Did you pray enough of them? My goodness, I must have prayed at least 14,000 from the time I was five to the age, I don't know, 12. I have no idea. I would go and I would confess sins. I didn't know what they were. I couldn't quite even pronounce them. For example, what's lasciviousness? <laughs> I'm confessing. I didn't know what it was, but the preacher said it, and I was sure that I committed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't care how many sinners' prayers you prayed or how many aisles you walked and how hard you wanted it to stick. Monday morning, you woke up, and there's you staring back at you in the mirror. Hear about the, the guy he began his prayer and saying, thank you Lord. I, I haven't spread gossip. I haven't committed any sins today. I haven't done any things that the things that you command us not to do. But in a minute, Lord, I'm going to open my eyes and my feet are going to hit the floor. <laughs> you get what I'm saying, right? You see, a committed faith is relationship driven. And Jesus is the one who does all the driving. We throw out catchy phrases like this one. And you've heard it. You've heard it from me. It's not really religion. It's religion. Oh yeah. We got that one down pat. But we don't really believe it is Christ who took the first steps and came right toward us. See, relationship is okay, but only if I can initiate it. That's the kind that we like. Good old fashioned pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of faith, right? Maybe muster some good old-fashioned energy. 
make ourselves a little bit better, like maybe we deserve grace. Yeah, that's it. But the reality is that a committed faith is relationship-driven that comes to us and from a God who first loved us. We say, I love you. God says, I loved you first. It's just Jesus. Just Jesus. Because the real gospel means Jesus plus nothing. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I claim. Further, a committed faith is not swayed or blocked by our personal trials and crises. Can you try that with me? A committed faith is not swayed or blocked by our personal trials and crises. <clears throat> Listen, even the best of the best preachers fall for this one all the time. The idea that somehow if we're a little more committed will not be swayed or blocked in times of difficulty. So once again, we didn't work hard enough at it. We flunked. We failed. We didn't make the grade. We just couldn't pass muster. And the gospel is just that true. We don't. But he did. And he does. Think about this. Jesus lived through the worst week of all history. He passed the test on Palm Sunday. He washed feet willingly on Monday, Thursday. The temptation he passed in Gethsemane. He endured the beatings, the floggings. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross, the crucifixion of Good Friday. And he did it all perfectly. Perfectly, you see. And with a good attitude. He even said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, he did it all perfectly, and he aced every exam with absolute perfection. What if we just trusted in his perfection? What if we put our trust in the fact that he aced every exam absolutely perfectly and just said thank you. Knowing that he did it for us because we couldn't do it for ourselves. You see, I dare you to live a week knowing and trusting that Jesus already during the Holy Week had a perfect week. So no matter what this week holds for us, we can do our best, fumbles and all, and know that we're loved. Just like that. Christ's committed faith is not swayed or blocked by our personal trials and crises. And sometimes we'll rise to the occasion, but more frequently we won't. But that committed faith is not us driven. It is his, it's that he is driven toward us. Christ's committed faith is not swayed or blocked by our personal trials and crises. Imagine that. Someone else took the test and we got into a much bigger place than Harvard. <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. We 
continue with the hymn of the day. LBW hymn number 98, Alas, it did my Savior. Thank you. 